My class is going to talk to us today, and Dino's been busy, he's been running around, but he's here, and so he's going to come up and introduce Mr. Clancy. Oh, Jerry, it's, uh, President Dennis, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you Mike Clancy today. Uh, the, the bio speaks for itself uh, in a lot of the way that I'll add simply to it that um, Mike is also an accomplished musician, vocalist, uh, performer here in the Monterey Peninsula area, and a member of the Monterey Bay Defense Alliance, uh, which helps uh, protect our bases from Iraq. So with, uh, without further ado, we're very fortunate to have Mike Clancy. Vocalists, not so much. <laughs> I am part of the uh, Monterey Peninsula Cypress here, so we do perform around here, but uh, oh, you know, uh, not a soloist. Anyway, thanks so much for all the uh, wonderful uh, uh, hospitality here, and thanks so much to Dino for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so I'm going to move pretty fast, so let's go ahead and jump in on this. Got a lot of material to show here, and. Uh, I'll make these slides available if you want afterwards, or you know, by email. So don't worry about all the details on the slides. But I have to move pretty quickly because there's a lot of material I'd like to show you today. And by the way, I've, I've learned a little bit about um, uh, Rotary's interest in climate change, and I'm very impressed with that. I know um, there's a, actually an initiative from Rotary International pertaining to climate change, and I've also looked at your six areas of focus. Lots of lots of overlap there with climate change issues. And also, I discovered just the other day that um, the founder of CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby, which I belong to, major player in this arena, uh, was a Rotarian. Uh, the late Marshall Saunders founded CCL back in 2007. And if we have time to talk about what CCL is doing now, we'll get to it and talk about it some more. So I'm going to quickly uh, move right in on an introduction and context to show you this plot of, of global mean surface temperature of the Earth over the past 22,000 years. And uh, global mean implies average over the entire face of the Earth. Surface temperature is over the ocean sea surface temperature over the land. So temperature a few meters above the surface. And for point of reference, here is the beginning of human civilization about 9,000 years ago. This is the last ice age. This upward trend here is recovery from the last ice age, driven by a variation in the Earth's orbit known as eccentricity. On a 100,000 year cycle, the Earth's orbit ranges from being more like a circle to being more like an ellipse. When it elongates into an ellipse, we go into an ice age, or it goes back to more like a circle. We come out of the ice age, it's driven by the gravitational effect of Jupiter and Saturn on the Earth. And here we see um, what's called the Holocene warm period that we're living in right now. And there's a slow cooling trend over the last 7,000 years. And that's driven by a variation in the Earth's orientation in space called obliquity. What happens here is the Earth's, uh, the tilt of the Earth's back axis uh, rocks back and forth between 24.5 degrees to 22.5 degrees on a 41,000 year cycle. Right now we're about halfway through that cycle and the Earth is losing tilt. For the past 7,000 years the Earth's lost about a little up less than one degree of angular tilt and that's caused this slow cooling trend. And then finally a couple, a couple other things here. This is known as the, little, the medieval warm period here. This is called the Little Ice Age. And finally we come to this red upward spike, which in fact is the post-industrial global warming we are concerned with. And there's two things become immediately apparent from this, from this chart. First of all, it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, we should be cooling. In fact, we, under normal circumstances, the Earth will be cooling for, for about the next 12,000 years, and then it would turn down more steeply and we go into the next ice age in about 18,000 years. But suddenly, we're warming, and we're warming very fast. In fact, we're warming about 20 times faster than natural climate change. This is what natural climate change looks like. This is what human-induced climate change looks like. So in fact, this global warming of the past 120 years is going in the wrong direction, about 20 times faster than natural climate change. And oh, by the way, its onset corresponds exactly with the beginning of the large emissions of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere associated with the Industrial Revolution. It didn't happen 1,000 years ago, it didn't happen 2,000 years ago. It happened right here when we started burning uh, coal. So I'm going to zoom in now on this red spike and show you this plot. This same parameter is global mean surface temperature of the Earth, but now it's plotted annually by year. The previous one had a time resolution on the graph of about 50 years. Now we're looking at it by, uh, by year. So you see a lot more detail here. And five different sources 
five different highly reputable sources, slightly different databases, different ways of looking at the data, but they all paint the same picture. And that picture is as follows. Not much change between 1850 and 1880. From 1880 to 1910, a slight decline. Beginning in 1910 up through 1945, pretty good upward trend. Slow downward trend from 45 to 75. And then beginning in the mid-70s, there's this rapid upward increase in temperature such that we're now running about 1.2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Now, a couple of things about this. Notice it doesn't go up in a straight line. It's kind of like the stock market. There's volatility in the stock market. There's volatility in this up and down motion here. That's called climate variability or natural, or I should say, a natural variability. And it's due to things like El Nino and La Nina. It's due to the exchange of heat between the atmosphere and the ocean. Distinctly different from climate change. Climate variability, these zigs and zags here, happen on time scales of 20 years or less. Climate change is this long-term upward trend here. <coughs> happens on time frames of 30 years or longer. So that's a good rule of thumb I'd like you to remember. If you're looking at a time record of 30 years or longer, you can do something about climate change. If you're looking at a record that's 20 years or less, you're not looking at climate change. You're looking at things like El Nino and La Nina and things like that. Um, also, notice how closely these four different uh, or five different analyses um, uh, agree with each other. That's because we have a lot of data out there and we have a very good handle on climate change. Now, I'm going to show you an animation of of uh, uh, one of these. In fact, I'm going to show you an animation of the, uh, the NASA product right here. And um, if Ray could key that off for me. Oh, but hang on one second, let me start running with the app. We're going to be looking at uh, an animation from uh, 18, 1880 to 2018 of, of global temperature service anomaly. Now, temperature anomaly is just a fancy way of saying temperature difference from a reference field. And the reference field in this case is the 1951 through 1980 average over the face of the Earth here. And um, what, uh, here's the temperature scale over here. Where it's white, the temperature is the same as that, that long-term average. Where it's yellow or orange, it's warmer. Where it's blue, it's cooler. Now, I'm going to call out the decades. You watch the colors change and pay particular attention to what happens in the 1970s. So here we go, Greg, if you could go kick that off. Okay, so here we are in the, in the 1890s. 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010, 2014. So a couple things here. Uh, first of all, the land is warming faster than the sea, about twice as fast. Even though about 95% of the heat of global warming is going into the ocean. The ocean has about 100 times the heat capacity of the land, and that's why the ocean is not warming up as much. Thank God for the ocean. If all the heat was going to the land, we actually would we'd be dead. I mean, basically, there'd be very few parts of, of, of the world that would sustain human life. Most of that heat is going to the ocean, and that acts as a moderating material. Note that the farther north you go, the more warm it gets. The Arctic is warming much faster than the lower latitudes. Notice in North America, if you look down in the southeastern United States, you haven't really seen much global warming. But look at what it looks like here in the west. You can see that we have, we have warmed quite a bit. Are we, are we picking up something? Is there comments coming or something? Let's <laughs> just go ahead. All right. So you can see how, you can see how much the west has warmed. And of course, with that warming, it's kind of drying. And that is a major contributor to the problems we have with wildfire. It's not the only contributor, but a major contributor. Notice that it's not warming everywhere. For example, it's cooling right here. There's a couple of areas where it's actually been cooling. And that's mainly because there are changes in the ocean circulation. In this case, the Gulf Stream is weakening and moving offshore as the climate changes. There are other changes associated with ocean circulation. So what's going on here? Well, um, Trying to get this thing to move. Okay. There we go. There's an overwhelming international scientific consensus on the following three points. Over the past 120 years, the Earth has been warming and the climate has been changing at alarming rates. Number two, global warming and the resulting climate change over the past 120 years have been driven almost exclusively by the Earth's greenhouse effect and the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused by human activities. Number three, without re dramatic reduction in the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the Earth will continue to warm and the climate will continue to change to the detriment of humankind. So stated succinctly, 
is happening, humans are causing it, and it's not a good thing. Now, there's no reputable science organization in the world that would disagree with those three points. And indeed, here's a partial list of leading science organizations that have made formal declarations confir confirming human induced global warming. All the, all the most prestigious organizations around the world have confirmed this. So let's jump in and talk about the greenhouse effect here. Whoops. All right. So the greenhouse effect, I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with it, but I'm going to take a little bit deeper into the science, so hang in there with me. That's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, the Earth is warmed by the sun, and it's cooled in two ways, by reflected solar radiation, reflected from clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere, reflected from the surface, and outgoing infrared radiation, also known as long-wave radiation. And um, greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere, somehow this clicker's not working. Okay, now you Okay. These greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap the outgoing infrared radiation such that you can see here uh, about 85% of the outgoing infrared radiation from the surface actually is, is, comes back down here. And human activities increase the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and increase the warming. And these gases are in order of how much uh, infrared radiation they trap are water vapor also, which we perceive as humidity in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, methane, the fluorinated gases, these are man-made gases used in things like refrigerants, for example. And finally, nitrous oxide. Notice I've colored water vapor differently. That's because water vapor doesn't drive global warming. It does accelerate global warming through the water vapor feedback loop. Hopefully I get a chance to talk about but it does not drive global warming. That's because it's in balance with a natural hydrologic cycle. It's not increasing uh, the way these other gases are. Now, in addition to uh, the greenhouse effect, we have feedback loops that amplify the warming. And one you may have heard about is the snow ice feedback effect, and it actually is pretty straightforward. Uh, increasing global temperatures cause decreasing snow and ice, and that causes increasing absorbed uh, solar radiation by land and sea. So you can kind of get a picture of here. Here's the ice, it's highly reflective. When it melts, at least behind a very dark ocean, that absorbs more solar radiation, which causes the Earth to warm more, which causes more ice to melt. And you go around the feedback loop and you amplify that warming. In addition, we have something called the water vapor feedback effect. As the oceans are warming, as we saw in that animation, uh, there's increased evaporation from the oceans. And also, the atmosphere can, as the atmosphere is warmer and warmer, it can hold more moisture. So the uh, water vapor in the atmosphere is increasing, but water vapor is, in fact, a strong uh, greenhouse gas, so it traps more uh, outgoing radiation, and it just amplifies you. You go around this loop, and it, it, you get more and more. Fortunately, there's a negative feedback loop, or others, otherwise we have a very unstable system, but in fact it is a pretty stable system. And that uh, negative feedback loop, and by the way, this is the only equation I'm showing in the whole talk, so don't be mad. <laughs> All right? And it says that the outgoing long wave radiation is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature in degrees Kelvin, which is the absolute temperature scale, which is just like the centigrade temperature scale, except it starts at absolute zero rather than freezing water on water. So as the Earth warms, more radiation is given off and it tries to cool the earth back down. And that's really good because in fact, if we didn't have this negative feedback effect going on, we'd have warmed about three times as much as where we are right now. And we'd be talking about worrying about 10 degrees centigrade warming by the end of the century rather than you know, two or three degrees centigrade. So, um, what are the consequences of all this going on? Well, I'd like to divide the consequences into two categories. Uh, consequences on the human world, or, or on the natural world, and consequences to, to humans. Let's talk first about the natural world. I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Increasing frequency and intensity of severe storms, increasing frequency of light threatening heat waves, uh, increasing frequency and intensity of floods in wet regions, increasing frequency of droughts and wildfires in dry regions. Oh boy, don't we know about that? We do live in a dry region. Decreasing mountain snowpacks and earlier snowmelt, big issue here in California since we get a lot of our summertime water supply from snowpack in Sierra. Rising sea levels, increasing mortality of coral reefs, decreasing productivity of, fish, of fisheries, loss of biodiversity in the natural world. So I want to actually focus on two of these, and one, one, the first one is the severe weather. And to understand what's going on there, we need to look at this vertical structure of the atmosphere. There's these four layers of the atmosphere, and one we're concerned about with is the Lowest layer called the troposphere. It's from the surface up to about 40,000 feet. So, for point of reference, here's where a jet airliner would be flying. 
And the point here is that the warming of global warming is happening only in the lower half of the troposphere. Everywhere above that is actually cooling. Why is that the case? Well, because the greenhouse gases are trapping the, the heat down here that would normally be would be warming up the upper part of the atmosphere. So you're heating the atmosphere from below, warming it from above, and that makes the atmosphere more unstable. Warm air rises, and it's that warm air rising into cool air that provides the kinetic energy of storms. And also, oh, by the way, the atmosphere getting, getting more moist, the seasonal temperatures getting warmer, and again, that increases the instability of the atmosphere. And as a result of that, from Meteorology 101, from basic common sense, you're going to get an increase in severe weather, and you can see that here. This is a plot of uh, severe storms, and that would be not just the summertime storms, but also the wintertime storms, like the blizzard that clogged Texas this past winter. Severe floods, heat waves, droughts, and wildfires. And you can see over this 30-year period, there's been this clear upward trend. And of course, we're experiencing that in spades just, just the past couple of weeks with the heat wave in the Northwest, the flood in Europe, and now we're hearing about a flood in China that's, they're talking about it being a thousand-year flood. So that's, you know, the climate change is happening, we're seeing it right now. Uh, the other thing is sea level rise. What we're looking at here is a plot of, of uh, global mean sea level rise from 1900 to, uh, I think, 2013. And the blue here is, is data from tide gauge data. The uh, orange here is from satellite altimetry data. It's actually the ability to, to, to measure sea level from space using something called a satellite altimeter. Closer to the mic. Okay. And um, the important, important point to note here is note the upward curvature of this. It's accelerating. The sea level is rising, but it's rising at an accelerating pace. And what we understand is that uh, particularly after 2050 is when the sea level is going to rise quite, quite uh, quickly. Real concern. What about the human consequences? And here's where there's a lot of overlap with uh, the, the work of, of humanitarians, because I know you have those six areas of focus, and there's a lot of overlap between what's going on here, the impacts of climate change, and your six areas of concern. Um, I'll just hit the high points. Increasing economic costs, increasing competition among nations for water and food, uh, increasing displacements of people leading to unrest, increasing threats to human health, uh, increasing mortality from heat waves. Heat waves, by the way, kill more people than any other weather phenomenon by far. Uh, other severe weather events, starvation, disease, and war. And these risks are unevenly distributed between groups of people and between regions. The risks are generally greater for disadvantaged people living on the edge in developing countries, and there's a lot of people in that category. Uh, subsistence farmers, for example, if their crop fails, they, they basically don't have any food to eat, that kind of thing. And there are those kind of people, or those people in that situation are very susceptible to climate change. So let's talk about these greenhouse gases that are causing all this problem in order of um, their uh, importance. Carbon dioxide, methane, fluorinated gases, nitrous oxide. This is the approximate contribution of these greenhouse gases to the global warming. And you can see that carbon dioxide is the dominant driver. It actually accounts for more warming than all of the other greenhouse gases combined. So let's talk about carbon dioxide. Where's, here's, here's a plot of carbon dioxide from 1700 to 2019. It's measured generally in terms of, uh, reported in terms of parts per million. Uh, in the pre-industrial era, CO2 in the atmosphere was around 280 parts per million. We just hit 419 this past uh, month or two, and that's an increase of 50% of the pre-industrial level. Uh, now, between 1850 and 2018, uh, human activities emitted about 1.6 trillion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. Not billion, trillion, 1.6 trillion tons and about uh, uh, 0.9 trillion tons is still there. We are currently uh, emitting about, globally emitting about 40 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere every year. 40 billion tons. So where's it coming from? Well, mainly from China. Uh, China's number one, uh, accounting for about 27%. We're number two at 14%, and then it goes on down there, India, Russia, and on down from there. Before we get too mad at China, uh, we need to take a look at per capita uh, emissions. Per capita, of course, you just take the total emissions from a country, divide by the total number of people in that country. Well, there's a lot of people in China. And so China drops way down the list down here, about 7.5, and we're number one. The average American emits about 16.5 tons of CO2 in the atmosphere per year. But we're followed pretty closely by Australia and Canada. The we three are just kind of stand out here like a sore thumb. Uh, China's pretty far down on the list. By the way, it's a good news story for California. We're, we're way down the list. We're, uh, California emits about nine tons per, uh, per person compared to the 17.5 for the U.S. average. So where does all this CO2 go? 
Well, here's a diagram of the um, fast carbon cycle. Uh, and I'm not going to go through details on it here, just going to cut to the chase. About 35% of the CO2 we put in the atmosphere is taken up by the land, uh, sequestered in the soil. That's what we want. That's really, really good. And we're trying to encourage that. And a lot of the solutions involve taking care of the natural world to try to increase that sequestration of carbon in the soil. About 20% is taken up by the ocean, and that's not so good. It's good that it's, going, it's not going to the atmosphere, but it's not so good because it's causing a lot of problems in the ocean. It's causing ocean acidification, you've probably heard about. The ocean is trending more towards the acidic side on the pH scale from the basic side. And that causes a problem for uh, the larva of shellfish. It causes a problem for coral reefs and things like that. It's also causing the oxygen levels in the ocean to go down, and it's causing problems with fisheries. And finally, about 45% uh, is accumulating in the atmosphere. So generally speaking, we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere about two to three times faster than the natural world can take it out. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, so where are we going from this? Well, it depends on what we, the people of the world, do. Um, here again, we're back to the 22,000 year view. If we meet the goals of the climate, of the Paris Climate Accord, and do what uh, you know, was recommended there, which was achieved uh, carbon neutral by uh, 2050. Carbon neutral means we have to reduce our emissions such that we're emitting no more than the natural world is able to take out. That means cutting emissions by a factor of about two or three. It's a heavy lift. We're kind of behind the eight ball right now. But if we were able to do that and then continue bringing emissions down to near zero by the end of the, of the century, uh, we would end up right about here. And that's uh, 1.5 degrees plus or minus 0.7 above pre-industrial. But you can see how radical that is. Look how stable the climate has been over the course of human civilization. Now suddenly we're making this big spike here. Now if we ignore the Paris Accord and uh, basically carry on business as usual and just forget about this whole thing, then we would be going way up here, and that's about 4.5 plus or minus 1 degree C, way up here, and look how that's almost the difference between an ice age and not an ice age. That's a huge unstable situation. Well, fortunately, I can tell you we're not going up here. We're doing better than that. And uh, as of right now, we're right about here. Um, the uh, Global Environment Program, part of the UN, issues annual report cards, reports on how well we're doing and meeting the Paris Accords. The last one came out this past fall. And they said we were on track for three degrees above pre-industrial. I think we're going to do better than this, due to a great extent by the fact that the U.S. has rejoined the Paris Accord. And, uh, you know, the Biden administration is intending to invest heavily in, in climate change. That's setting the, the pattern for the rest of the world. So we'll do better. Uh, I doubt if we're going to make it down here, but we'll fall somewhere in here. So what needs to be done? Well, I'm a big fan of Project Drawdown. And by the way, I did a little research on Rotary, and uh, I read about your climate project there, and they, they talk about Project Drawdown. They, they actually highlight it, so I was really pleased to see that. And again, it has a lot to do with the fact there's a lot of overlap with your six areas of focus. I highly recommend their website. It's drawdown.org. They have come up with about 82 solutions uh, in nine different sectors that essentially provide a roadmap for stopping and eventually reversing global warming and climate change. And the nice thing they've done there is not only have they uh, talked about these solutions, they've actually analyzed them carefully, they've ranked them in terms of their impact, and also priced them out, what's the total price of implementing this. And so just quickly, um, here are the nine sector sectors, and uh, these first uh, five are all about reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, things like you know, solar panels and wind turbines and so forth. Uh, the ones down here are all about protecting and enhancing the ability of the natural world to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Uh, this one here, engineered sinks, that's things like direct air capture and machines that would actually pull carbon dioxide out of the water, out of, out of the atmosphere. And finally, health and education, which again overlaps a lot with uh, uh, initiatives of Rotarians. That has to do a lot with uh, limiting global population growth, which is a part of this issue. And finally, I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, this book by Bill Gates just came out in the past year. It's quite good. Uh, a lot of overlap between what Bill Gates talks about here and the uh, uh, Project Drawdown and their book and their website. But Gates comes from, from the standpoint of being an entrepreneur. He's a, he's, a, he's a geek, but he's also an entrepreneur and a lot of, lot of discussion there about you know the green premium and things like that, so it's quite good. And then finally, one last slide uh, on carbon pricing. This is uh, uh, a tool in the toolbox. It's basically um, it's uh, it's something which is implemented in uh, 60 countries currently, and generally places a tax or a fee on fossil fuels at or near the point of production. And the idea is to, to discourage uh, fossil fuel use. If you're heavy fossil fuel use, you're going to pay more. 
if you were uh, a low fossil fuel user, you'll actually get money back. Uh, there were 10 different carbon pricing bills introduced in the last Congress, one of them by Congressman Panetta, the uh, Climate Action Rebate Act, which I thought, by the way, was the best one. He hasn't decided yet whether he's going to reintroduce, reintroduce it or not. But there are currently four uh, carbon pricing bills going forward, one of which uh, was really the granddaddy of them all. It's called PICDA, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It was, it is the main uh, initiative of CCL, the Citizens Climate Lobby, which I'm a member of, but I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier or not, but uh, I discovered that just recently that the founder of CCL was a Rotarian. Um, and, uh, and, and, they, and this EICDA is kind of the, uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the outcome of that. And the final slide here, closing comments, what can you do? Learn the science behind climate change. Well, you've taken a big step today by sucking through my talk, for sure. <laughs> Use your position leadership in the community, community to, act, to act, advocate for action. And of course, you guys are absolutely leaders in the community, so that should work out. Whenever you have an opportunity to, to interact with other leaders in the community, uh, be they political or otherwise, let them know that you want to see action taken on this issue. Join an FC loop like CCL. We have an active CCL chapter here in Monterey. And finally, vote for candidates who will address your concerns on climate change. So thank you very much. You've been a great audience. And, uh, I'm getting more questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm amazed you got through that quickly. That's wonderful. Because we got at least we got you through the end, which is great. Questions, please. David. This is kind of half comment, half question. Yes. First of all, thank you. That was really tremendous. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a tremendous presentation. Thanks a lot, Nancy. Um, we often hear, you know, that we need to have more trees. Plant, you know, watch all the forests because that's what's going to help us. And agriculture never gets any credit for all the row crops uh, that they plant that are a big part of the solution. And uh, I don't know in your uh, climate groups if uh, that's something that perhaps could become more recognized because farmers are definitely doing their part uh, with the, the crops that they plant all across the world. Absolutely, and uh, a big part of, of the, of the um, um, project drawdown is agriculture, indeed, and you know regenerative agriculture. There's a lot of initiatives in the Salinas Valley on that, and um, you're absolutely right. Agriculture is a big part of it, and uh, you know the cover crops and trying to minimize the use of nitrogen fertilizers, all that's really important. And there's a lot of good work going on there. There's actually a bill before Congress called the um, Growing Climate Solutions Act, which is focused on um, Helping agriculture meet those kinds of goals. Thanks for that comment. Now, I have a technical question, maybe a little bit uh, academic, because yes. the effect is not going to help us uh, by the time it kicks in if it's there. But I was struck by the high power of the your one equation uh, yes. that seems to really have an uh, increasingly important effect. Just if we do nothing, does that high power diffusion eventually overtake the trend for? Toward climate, uh, toward the temperature rise. Great question. Well, uh, a little thought experiment here. What if we? Uh, what would happen if we um, suddenly have a magic wand and we were able to make it such that you know um, the uh, greenhouse gases remain constant in time? So in other words, we reduce our emissions such that the natural world is just exactly in balance with emissions. So the greenhouse gases would become constant. Assuming assuming the sun remains constant, doesn't get brighter or darker. You know that. You know, remains constant. Assuming uh, aerosols in the atmosphere remain the same, though, don't have big uh, volcanic eruptions. If all those things remain constant, what would happen? Well, the Earth would continue to warm for a couple of decades, but at a slowing pace, and then that negative feedback effect you mentioned would, would, would come into balance, uh, and we would then stabilize the temperature. Uh, but it takes, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's like a big ocean liner coming into the dock, and you got to you got to plan way ahead. If, but the, and the problem is, um, we're not doing that. We're, we're nudging the system out of balance. We're nudging the system more and more towards the warming side of things. And that, that's the big problem. Yeah. How do you feel about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett investing in sodium reactors to potentially create more electricity for us without carbon? Great, great question. Great question. Um, I love to talk about nuclear power. Generally, I haven't been a big proponent of nuclear power, but it is a complicated subject. But just, just briefly, all of the nuclear uh, power plants in the world right now, operational power plants, are second and third generation power plants. Most of them are second generation. The third generation are pretty close to second generation. 
What Bill Gates is talking about there are the fourth generation plants. And there are about a half a dozen different designs on the drawing board now. Many of them are, are based on, are, the cooling is, is a molten sodium, molten, molten salt. The big advantage there is they can operate at, at, at atmospheric pressure as opposed to very high pressure like the water cooled ones do. And many of the designs are based on thorium rather than uranium. So the fourth generation plants on the drawing board significantly mitigate the three big problems of existing nuclear power. And those big problems are, are po uh, possibility of catastrophic failure. Ask the people of Fukushima and, and uh, Chernobyl about that. Uh, what do you do with the nuclear waste? Uh, nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, they significantly mitigate those three big problems. I don't think they totally eliminate them, but they do significantly mitigate them. China has announced plans to field one or two uh, nuclear power plants based on thorium by the end of this decade. Other countries are looking at it. There have been a couple of test reactors built. No power plants are currently in operation. I know Bill Gates is an investor in that. And I think the answer is yes, I think it is going to become part of the solution. Yeah. One last yeah, question. I don't have a question. Oh, we do. Okay, who do we have? Dave Berger? Tell Dave, go ahead. Dave, Mike, can you hear me? This is Dave Berger. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Mike, how significant um, is the difference between a hybrid vehicle and a plug-in electric in terms of carbon neutrality? Well, um, I think you, you gain a lot by going to the plug-in, particularly if you're able to uh, charge that plug-in from uh, solar panels on your roof, which, by the way, is something I'm working on making happen. And uh, ultimately, though, I think we're going to electric vehicles. I mean, electric vehicles are the future. There's a lot of things we have to do to get to that future, though. And one of the things we have to do is we have to actually double the size of our, the electric grid. Right now, if everyone, had, I waved the magic wand, everyone immediately had their cars change on electric vehicles, we wouldn't be able to charge them. Even if we had the power to do it, the electric grid wouldn't, wouldn't hold it. We've got to double, at least double, maybe triple the size of the electric grid. We've got to add charging stations around. And there's going to come a, a really, I think, a tipping point with electric vehicles when they hit a range of 600 miles. Right now, typical range is around 300 miles, maybe pushing 400 miles. When you get to 600 miles, then you've got a car that you can drive coast to coast. You can drive 600 miles during the day, and then you check into your motel and you charge the car overnight and drive 600 miles the next day. That's what you know, pretty much people do. You can't do that now. And it's just a matter of time. The batteries are getting better year by year. So at some point, we'll, we'll switch to whole new battery technology. The car itself will become a battery, and that's going to happen. And uh, electric vehicles, you know, all of the major manufacturers basically have said within 10 years, we're not going to make, we're not going to be making gasoline powered cars anymore. And quite frankly, electric vehicles, there's so many fewer moving parts and so much little bit fewer maintenance, the batteries are getting better. It's just a matter of time. There's, there was a time when you would see an electric car and say, wow, that's, look at that, there's a Tesla over there. There's going to come a time when it's exactly the opposite. You're going to see a gasoline power car and say, no, it's, what an oddity, there's a gasoline power car in there. That'll probably happen in about 10 or 15 years. Last question, we're running over a little bit. Chris, please. Thank you, a great presentation. Thanks. So I have uh, solar panels on my house and an EV car, which is probably why it's so cold in Pitt, sort of group. What what is the actual cost though? I mean you mentioned China being this huge producer of greenhouse gases. Those products are all made in China. So what is the cost of that to the environment to produce those great things for us here? And the second thing is I read a day or two ago was that uh, parts of the Amazon rainforest are actually producing more CO two now than they actually absorb. So it's kind of failing, it's crashing as a system. Huge. Yeah, um, really solar panels, you know, there's certainly an environmental impact there, but in the, in the long term it's, it's definitely positive. We need to move towards solar. The big thing about solar, of course, is the price just keeps coming down and down. It's kind of like computer chips, it just keeps coming down and down as they're going to become more of a commodity. As far as the Amazon is concerned, um, you know, they've been deforesting the Amazons, you know, I've read it's like you know one soccer field per minute is being deforested down there, and that's a big problem because the Amazon accounts for in terms of, of terrestrial take, uptake of carbon, the Amazon at least before the deforestation started was accounting for about 20 percent of the take up. I haven't heard that it's a source yet, but it certainly has been going down. And uh, taking care of the rainforest, taking care of all the forests, taking care of the grasslands, taking care of the you know the, the marine environment, taking care of the of coastal wetlands, it's all an important part of the solution. That's the kind of thing they talk about quite a bit uh, at Project Drawdown, so I do recommend that website, drawdown.org, you can get a lot out of that. Um, as you may or may not know, as you look at 
some rotary uh, websites, we were heavily involved in uh, polio eradication and uh, Polio Plus is the organization. So what we do is we're going to make a contribution in your name to Polio Plus to help fight the, <coughs> excuse me, the polio scourge, scourge on the earth. So thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much.